Evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the Six Bridges Book Festival for tonight's event. Um, tonight, we're going to have an homage to all things Anthony Bourdain. Um, I just want to say that right off the bat, FYI, this event is going to feature adult topics and adult language. So fair warning, this is not appropriate for kids. Um, but just to start off a little bit, uh, I want to just kind of give it feels a little bit awkward to give an introduction of a man who really needs no introduction but i do want to talk just a little bit about anthony bourdain and um the gifts that he gave us so the world was kind of first widely introduced to him in 2000 uh many of us knew him as a chef uh but he had just so happened to write a best-selling book um, and he had made a name for himself in, in the New York kitchens already, but with his book Kitchen Confidential, he became known to a much larger worldwide audience. It was a New York Times bestseller. If you've not ever read it, I highly recommend it. Absolutely amazing book. Let you know about kind of the, the dark and dirty secrets of the restaurant industry. Um, it turns out that Bourdain was just as skilled with a pen as he was with a knife. He continued to develop his writing career over the years. He wrote more best-selling books. He wrote articles and essays and some top-notch esteemed publications. And it turns out he was a natural in front of the camera too. Um, he turned the kitchen career into the writing career and then into a television career. His shows, A Cook's Tour, No Reservations, and Parts Unknown combined his love of food with his appetite for travel and his unique raw style of storytelling. Anthony Bourdain also loved his drinks, and at one time he really loved his drugs a lot. He loved punk rock and women and cigarettes and calling people out on their bullshit. And he was really, really passionate about all of these things that he loved. But unfortunately, those passions just weren't enough to appease the demons in his life. In June of 2018, he was found dead of an apparent suicide in a hotel room. And while Anthony Bourdain certainly left us too soon, he did leave a legacy and a wide body of work for us to enjoy. So tonight, with the help of some special guests, we're going to explore his craft and his memory. Um, before I introduce our first guest, though, I do want to tell you, uh, believe it or not, Anthony Bourdain has a new book out. Um, this is called Anthony Bourdain, World Travel and a Reverent Guide, and it kind of gleans some writing that he had done in the past and um, writing that had not yet been published. And it's in a, kind of your typical travel guidebook format. And it's a whole lot of fun. It goes city by city. Um, I highly recommend getting a hold of this book, checking it out at the library, giving it a read. So, because it really is remarkable, kind of the depth and breadth of his work that we're still getting new content from him. So that said, I do want to introduce our first guest this evening. Some of you might recommend, excuse me, might recognize him. His name is Anthony Bossa, and he is joining us from New York City. Anthony started his writing career with Rolling Stone magazine before he left to go out on his own and write his first book, which was a biography of Eminem. And he's written plenty more books since then. And we were actually honored to have him as a guest of the fest last year. So Anthony, welcome back. Hi there. It's good to Hi. be back. 
Nice to see you again. So, you know, I, I, I think I joked last time we talked and said, hopefully next time we get together, we do the fest, it can be in person. I was a little optimistic. Um, not quite there. Not, not quite, quite there yet. We're getting there. We're getting there. We'll get you down to Little Rock one of these days. Uh, but we really appreciate you being with us again this evening. So uh, I just, we, we kind of wanted to bring you in because you were in New York. I mean, if I... Am I correct in that you moved to New York kind of right around the same time that Bourdain was kind of starting to become the hot thing and the food scene and all that kind of stuff, but kind of mid to uh, late 90s, yeah. is that correct? Well, I mean, I grew up here, so I'm a, I'm a local. Oh, okay. But, um, gotcha, yeah. But I left for, for I went to college in Chicago and then, uh, you know, spent a year and actually it's like a ski bomb in Colorado um, and then came back in 94. Yeah. So that's kind of when it was starting. And, um, you know, I was an intern at Rolling Stone and, uh, I lived in my, well, second at my first apartment was a tiny little box right by the empire state building. Second one that was a little nicer, <laughs> a little more livable, um, was right in the Murray Hill neighborhood, which is sort of like Lexington Avenue in the thirties. And it was pretty close to Les All, which was the restaurant where he did his most yeah. of his cooking right on Park Avenue. And I think it was like 28th street or something like that. So, so did you get um, to eat there? Yeah. Oh, I used to eat there. Cause it was, it had late hours. It was like a French bistro. You know, I was like, I was just, a, I was like just out of college going to as many rock and roll shows as possible. And, and uh, it was awesome. So, you know, when he did come out and write the book, I realized that I had been eating this man's steak frites, which is like one of the things he, one of the recipes that I like took from him and, you know, listened. There's so many things that I learned from him in Kitchen Confidential. I just loved mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, at the time I was starting to learn about the food world, had some friends who were chefs, um, you know, I, like I was still pretty young, so they were working their way up. But uh, there's just things you'll never forget. Like I forever cooked with shallots instead of onions because of Anthony Bourdain. Um, yeah. I learned about demi gloss and I used to like have that in my freezer and, you know, basically like it's a sugo, it's like a, you know, it's, it's just like, uh, basically makes any sauce better. So I started to like, just yeah. little things like that can kind of up your game. Um, and also like his steak free is really good. If, if anyone ever cooks yeah. try, try his recipe, it's incredible. So that was great. I also never looked at brunch the same way again. And Kitchen Confidentially goes on a long thing of what New York restaurants do for brunch. So like just, ne yeah. I mean, if you haven't read it, never get the seafood omelet. Just don't get a lobster or anything at yeah. brunch on Sunday. It's leftover cat food. So um, that made a huge impression on me because he, he brought such a, he had such a cool way of writing about food. Uh, that isn't very food writery, if that makes any sense. I mean, a lot of yeah. my friends are food writers. Very, well, yeah, no, I mean, that's an excellent point. And, and to your point about how you learned so much from his books, I mean, he, he was a very approachable in his um, attitude towards food and towards writing and towards travel and everything. And so, yeah, I mean, I can see how, you know, he, it influences people not only with with food and the way they explore food but also in writing too and um you know i talked about his kind of unique and raw style and having read your work you kind of have a similar storytelling style did he have any influence on you beyond the food and perhaps in writing too um i would say i didn't uh, you know i think we probably like the same writers you know, I would say that, thank you for saying that, because I think that he has a very approachable, I, approachable way of discussing, you know, something that discussing food isn't, isn't easy. It's like, I do compare it to, you know, when I try to write about music, you're taking something that involves all of your senses and putting it into like two dimensions and trying to make, explain that to somebody. So it's definitely a challenge. And he accomplished that. He, he brought you into the scene and like made you feel like you were there. Um, I think we probably both like the same writers. You know, I didn't really, I, I mean, when I read his writing, I was like, I loved it. I was like, oh, I like this guy's style. And I do try to do like a short sentence, kind of visceral, you know, kind of bring a person there. Um, you know, I'm sure we both, we both love yeah. Charles Bukowski and, and like, uh, you know, Kurt Vonnegut. Those are my people, Catherine Dunn, mm -hmm. um, Dennis Johnson. Like I love, I love short blunt sentences that are very visceral. So he definitely had that, that definitely, you know, that appealed to me greatly and made him imminently yeah. readable to me. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, so kind of back to his writing, but to yours also, for Bourdain, music was very intertwined with his craft. Um, yeah. I mean, he loved the Ramones so much that he dedicated an entire book to him. 
He yeah. was big into, into punk. Um, but my favorite part, though, is something I read about him one time is that he banned certain artists from being played in his kitchen and that if you played <laughs> Billy Joel, Elton John, or The Grateful Dead, that you were automatically terminated. I don't know if that's true, but I love it. Um, it makes, makes for so, a good point, so. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So, you know, for him, music, food, it, it all went together. And you have a podcast called Wine On Me and where you uh, drink wine and talk about wine while also discussing music with some really sure. amazing musicians and, and other people. And so you combine the kind of food, drink, hospitality with music. I mean, also, so talk to me a little bit about the connection there between the food and the music and just, you know, these, these two creative acts kind of coming together in general. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, I've, I've always thought of uh, music and the like fine art of cooking. Yeah. I mean, I cook and that, that kind of stuff is fine, but you know, when you go to a restaurant, especially a fine dining restaurant, which wasn't really Tony Bourdain, he was more a working man, you know, kind of, kind of chef um, that doesn't, that, you know, by all means he's incredible, but like when you go to like a fine dining restaurant, to me, it's sort of like taking in an art show and it's like an ephemeral, I compare it like music and a great meal to like an ephemeral performance. It's mm -hmm. an ephemeral art that's going to disappear. The difference with music is that it can be recorded and sort of, you know, relived. Uh, it's not the same as being in the room as it is, you know, watching a video of whoever your favorite band is do it. But, you know, you can't really, unless there's technology I don't know about that I'd love to know about, you can't record the sensation of having an incredible meal. I wish you could. So, um, you know, there's a there's a real sublime beauty to that to me that, you know, these are if, if you look at like a fine dining restaurant like a per se or 11 Madison Park, something that has like three Michelin stars, um, the amount of work that goes in behind the scenes to make that whole thing come off um, and even the performance of, you know, plating and all that stuff. That's an art form. So yeah. to me, they're exactly the same. And I completely understand why chefs are so into music. Um, a lot of food people are really into music. I mean, they go hand in hand. I mean, you, you, I think you need motivation, you know, back there uh, yeah. if you're working on the line. So I totally get that. But to me that they're, they're both this like sublime, sublime ephemeral art forms and just magical moments. And those are, you know, the kind of thing that you'll remember, like the quote that introduced mm -hmm. us when you talk about the oyster, that stuff really burns itself into our psyche and it gets into our subconscious and sort of affects who we are. So it makes yeah. complete sense that those things go together. Um, you know, in my podcast, what I do is whoever my guest is, they pick their favorite artist or record. And I have a couple of wine experts, uh, they're buyers. So we don't just like use one, one you know, vineyard or anything. And we talk and we select like the perfect bottle and sometimes down to the vintage of what would go perfectly with like, you know, this guest whose favorite record is like Radiohead, OK Computer or something. Um, and then we drink that wine and we talk about it. And a lot of the same kind of stories come up, you know, the first time that the person heard that song or heard whatever it is about that artist that does it for them. It either brings back an incredibly vivid memory or they know exactly where they were the day, who is in the car, like whatever the case may be. And I think food does that too. So to me, they're both very powerful, like transported, you know, time transporting, I don't know, magical substances, if you will. I absolutely agree. Um, we had one of our uh, guests, hi, John, asked uh, us to repeat the name of your uh, podcast. So it's, oh, it's vinyl. vinyl. Instead of, no, it's, it's, yes, it's instead it's of just, vinyl. No, it's just, just vinyl. Just vinyl. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. So instead I mean, of vinyl, it's got the W yes. in, in front of it. And it's a great listen. I, um, in fact, the other day, I just re-listened to the episode with the uh, sommelier, uh, Matt, and it was absolutely fantastic because I wanted to go back to some of the wines he had recommended. So I do yeah, recommend yeah. people to listen to that. And now um, that we can get so, together again, there'll, there'll be a new season soon now that we can finally like get together. Now that you can actually drink wine. wine in person with people. You, yeah, you can. I was talking drink, about it. I didn't want to do over it. Zoom. That, it doesn't have the same impact. Yeah. I didn't want to do it on Zoom. I didn't want to. You got to smell it together. You got to get into it. I didn't want to do it with mm -hmm. masks on, you know, like eight feet apart in my apartment. So so I have a couple episodes that were, you know, kind of supposed to be the beginning of a season. I might just throw those up real soon because it'll be like two years, you know, they'll be like getting old and then we're going to do a proper thing, but uh, this isn't about me. <laughs> so we'll do it. 
I still, though, b- before I do let you go, though, I know you are working on a new biography. So if you really yes. quickly want to uh, pimp it out for us just a second, let us know what it is and when we should expect it. Sure. It's plug time. Um, I've already mm-hmm. finished it. I wrote the, it's a co-write with uh, Ray Kwan of the Wu-Tang Clan and it's his autobiography. You could, it's uh, if you go to my website or just, you know, just Google it, it's out there. You can pre-order it. Comes out on Simon and Schuster in November and very excited about it. It's totally done. We're just Excellent. handed in, sending off to the printer this week. Um, and then I have a, I have like three other projects that are contracts are happening. So I can't, I get, I get really superstitious okay. until I get the contract signed, but don't jinx it. Don't bunch jinx more it, big jinx names. It. So okay. you'll, yeah, you'll see. Maybe we'll talk next year. All right. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll gladly have you back. And like I said, hopefully one of these days in person. So again, thank you so much for being with us this evening. I appreciate it. Um, right. But folks, I, I'm done with, with this Anthony for now, but we're not done with the um, program overall. Um, I recently had a chance to sit down with uh, local chef Gilbert Alakinez and travel industry veteran Tony Poe. We had a really fantastic, really interesting conversation about uh, Anthony Bourdain's influence on their careers and on their industries and on their lives in general. Um, I think the three of us probably could have sat and talked for hours if we didn't cut ourselves off. So um, up next, we're going to have a video of that conversation with some of the highlights of their discussion. But before we go to that video, I want to um, let y'all know a couple of things. Um, There is another uh, Cal Six Bridges Book Festival event coming up next month. It's actually on June 3rd. It's with Eric Cervini. He's a historian and he's going to discuss his book, The Deviant's War, and it covers um, LGBTQIA history in America, kind of mostly pre-Stonewall. New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. It's going to be a fantastic event um, in conjunction with Pride Month. So I encourage you to visit the Six Bridges Book Fest website or Facebook page to find out more information about that. Um, The other thing I would say before we cut to the video is, so one of the beautiful things about these Zoom discussions and remote events that we're able to have is that we've been able to bring in guests from all over the world and people from all over the world can attend. Um, So it's been really fun for that. But on the other hand, technology being what it is, sometimes we have technical issues. There have been some technical issues with this video earlier this evening. So I just want to prepare you for that. Just know that if um, it does get cut off for any reason, we will end the presentation, but we're not going to leave you hanging. As soon as we get everything fixed, we will send everybody an email with the link to where that they can watch this video on the YouTube channel. So don't worry if it gets cut off right at a juicy part, because I'm telling you some of the conversations we had were got really good and juicy. Um, you will get to see the rest of it when we get it loaded to the YouTube channel. So um, I'm about to turn it over to the guys who are going to start the video for us. And I really hope you enjoy it. And again, thanks so much for being here with us this evening. And I hope to see you at some future Cal's events. Thanks so much. forward to talking with them about Anthony Bourdain, his legacy, his influence on um, their industries and how people eat and travel and write as a whole. Um, I'll start actually by introducing Gilbert Alakinez here to my left. Um, He's the chef here at Flyway. 
Uh, I've known Gilbert for many years. He's an incredible chef. Just a few minutes ago, I was actually begging him to make some greens for me, in <laughs> fact. Um, he used to be at the Clinton Presidential Center. He ran the lab food truck, um, which if you ever missed out on those breakfast tacos and hamburgers, I'm very sorry for you. Um, you can you can make breakfast tacos. Again. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Um, over this past year during the pandemic, he's actually worked with uh, Chef Jose Andres, who has the World Central Kitchen, and he's been making sure, um, along with some other chefs and food truck proprietors, that people in the Little Rock community have stayed fed with fresh, healthy meals during all this, especially school children, right? I think y'all did a lot yeah, to help get kids Probably fed like when they weren't in school. Over 200,000 meals, yeah, something like that. So it was, it was, I mean, it was great. I mean, it was an awesome experience, especially with, well, we didn't directly work with Jose Andres, but it was nice to be part of that organization. That was, yeah. actually, and know, the good that they do. The community. Yep, but now you're here at Flyway, now as we are. <laughs> um, so, and over here to my right, I have Tony Poe. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in this community have heard of Poe Travel. Tony grew up in the travel industry. Um, his parents, Fred and Tina Poe, were the founders of Little Rock's Poe's Travel. Um, after trying out a lot of different careers and a lot of places across the U.S., we were talking about some of those a few minutes ago. Like, give us a couple of the oddest jobs you've ever had. Uh, private investigator in Chicago. Yep. Comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. That definitely does it. Um, he eventually found his way back into travel and the family business. He did marketing and PR for the family's travel agency. Um, I first really got to know Tony when he was not with the travel agency anymore, but he was working for um, a big international um, luxury travel consortium. And um, that's kind of how I guess we met when when I was, you know, working in hospitality also. And so you worked with them for a long time and have done sales with some luxury travel groups. And so you are all things travel. You know this world backwards and forth. How yeah. many how many countries have you been to? Uh, I kind of lost count. Uh, somewhere eighty plus, maybe. Right. You know, borders change, so the numbers change. <laughs> how does that compare to Tony Bourdain? Do you know? That's a real good question. I wonder I if you've been more places than he. Went. I I would be surprised. I don't. Wow. I never thought about that. Hmm. Hmm. Have to count it up. Yeah. Um. But so most recently, though, he had a um, local bar and um, great music joint. It was Atlas Bar on Main Street. Miss that place, that Thai salad. That oh, was yeah. incredible. I loved it because. Um, I still have the recipe. Do you? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, you kind of combine two things that you love food and travel at Atlas because all of the dishes there at the restaurant were inspired by things that you had eaten on your travels yep. and you brought that back and everything. We do miss that place, but I'm glad to know you still have that recipe too. So of course. anyway, um, we'll kind of, enough about us, we'll kind of get the conversation going here a little bit. You know, we all know that Anthony Bourdain brought us so many TV programs, you know, his writing that he did and for newspapers and, and other periodicals and his books also. Um, and even after his death, he has still been giving to us um, his newest book. It's a posthumous book, but it's actually his book with a lot of his writing is um, Anthony Bourdain World Travel. It says it's an irreverent guide and it is kind of set up like any travel guide that you will find on the shelves of a bookstore and that it goes kind of by city by city and breaks it down into here's what you should eat. Here's the mode of transportation you should take. Um, here's what you'll find at the airport. This is a bar I recommend. And it's all pulled from, some of it's pulled from quotes in his previous writings and his TV shows and things like that. But some of it are just notes that he made in his travel notebook. And um, his, an editor helped pull this together along with his brother. And it's a really fantastic book um, that I recommend everybody get, even if you're never going to travel to some of the places, let's say some of them. Um, some of them are a little out there. Oman, I'm probably not ever gonna go to Oman, although it'd be cool, but you could still read about it and kind of travel vicariously through this. But um, more than this specific book, what we kind of wanted to talk about today, just like I mentioned his legacy and what he um, left for people, how he influenced travel, how he influenced the way we talk about travel, 
influence food, the way we talk about food. Um, so I kind of want to get started by talking about um, his impact on the restaurant industry, on food and drink. Um, I found this quote from him that I absolutely love. Meals make the society, hold the fabric together in lots of ways that were charming and interesting and intoxicating to me. The perfect meal or the best meals occur in a context that frequently has very little to do with the food itself. And I think we saw that um, a lot in his show when he would travel to, you know, a lot of different places, crazy places sometimes, and and seek out some unique dining experiences. And, you know, a lot of times he would say, this is not the best of this dish that I've ever had, but it was the people that he was with, the company and that kind of stuff. So I just kind of, you know, get y'all's thoughts on how he, I know it's, this is a, a broad scope question, but how he influenced the food industry as a whole, how he influenced the way we eat food, the way we make food, that kind of stuff. So take it away, Gilbert, I'll let you start since oh, we're in your God. restaurant here. <laughs> so, I think he brought, from his shows, he brought a lot of more culture from different countries out, for sure. Um, because, you know, a lot of people, I mean, there people do travel, but I think they tend to stay in the States. And but I think he just brought a worldly view of what other countries do. Uh, because I know when I started watching, you know, his first show, uh, a Cook's Tour, you know, I was, get interested in stuff that I've never seen before. I mean, you know, when you go to different countries in Asia, you know, uh, some of the Mediterranean countries, some of the Arab countries, like I've never seen, you know, I think at one, they had a camp, you know, and they all sat around his table on the ground and everybody was eating with their hands. And like, it was just huge kind of family style dish, you know, that everybody kind of sat around and I was just, in awe, I was just like, man, I never thought a camel was something that you would actually eat. But then, you know, being a cook, being a chef, you know, you kind of, it's like, oh, well, what else? What else, you know, do people eat around the world? And, um, but I definitely, he definitely brought, I think, people to be more curious to what other cultures eat. I know when I was at the Clinton Center, you know, I was uh, doing, uh, the around the world dinners. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have to research a five course meal from one country and we would, you know, kind of do that once a month. And of course to try to incorporate one country into five courses was just crazy sometimes, but it was just kind of cool seeing what, you know, everybody else, every culture did, every country did. And I think that's kind of, you know, I guess Bourdain kind of brought that for me, but then I was always more curious to how, you know, other cultures did, did their food. And, you know, it was just kind of cool. I think he brought that to a lot of people on the TV show. And I think people were just getting more curious to food. I think in general, here in Little Rock, especially, it kind of brought in people's perception of what other people eat. So, you know, over the time, you know, different places have kind of grown just because people are more adventurous into other food and other cultures. I wish people would love food the way I kind of love food or <laughs> kind of how we love yeah. food and, you know, kind of, but you know, it, it's fine. You know, we'll get there. It might be slow, but I think eventually we'll get there and uh, I'm kind of excited about it. So. about you? Uh, and the food. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was just, everything you're saying, I agree with completely. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you know, what I, what I liked about the way that he, approached the world was, you know, just with open eyes, open arms, open heart. And, you know, there's a, I, I, this word is so overused, uh, it, but there was a, a degree of authenticity about what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer to say he was a really genuine guy. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's better, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he was able to, like, like you said, get people to think and, and see maybe even digest a little bit through through their watching what he was doing and uh, inspiring people to maybe you know get a little bit out of their comfort zone and mm -hmm. i think that you know he sort of personified the you know the philosophy that i agree with is like you know travel is is getting out of your comfort zone it's getting it, it gives you perspective and it makes you reflect on you know who you are and where you know 
what your place is in this mm-hmm. world and what your life is and, and the place that you live. And uh, you know, travel obviously broadens people's perspective. And uh, it's a pity that, that so few Americans have passports and, and use them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I think that perhaps he might have you know, changed, had moved the needle a little bit yeah. on that. I, I, yeah. I, I stand by that. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. And uh, so hopefully that, that momentum that you're talking about, you know, the, the evolution of the food scene here in Little Rock, and I think it's happening all over the country. I mean, when visitors come to Little Rock, they often comment to me, wow, for a city of this size, you really have some yeah. great restaurants. Yes, you know? we really do. Um, so, you know, even though we have a, a ways to go, we've come a long way. We've come a long way. Um, you know, uh, and uh, so, and I think that, you know, people like Anthony Bourdain can be partly um, help, you know, responsible mm-hmm. for that. I, t- I tell you one thing that I liked about his, watching his show um, and as he um, engaged with the people in the uh, in other countries and he, he taught me and I'm sure other people got this too to be very respectful of the way people in other cultures do things and just because we might turn our nose up at a camel doesn't mean that everybody should turn their nose up at a camel because we might question a certain type of food you know food production technique or the way people serve things maybe the way they kill their animals you know that kind of stuff he was very good at being non-judgmental about all that kind of stuff and i think he really kind of got that point across that hey it's you know it's one thing to go and try and that kind of stuff but you've got to understand this is these are the people who make this these are the people who create this this is the way they do it this is why they do it this way um, and yeah, I just like that he was, he was very respectful of that and very accepting and you know, it, and even if you're eating in your own hometown and somewhere that's not technically adventurous, I think he kind of taught us to again, be respectful of those people, be respectful of the people who are making the food for you, be respectful of the people who got the ingredients to the kitchen. Um, and also be curious about that process. Learn more about, you know, how you're, don't just accept the fact that something, you know, comes from a kitchen and it gets put in front of you. Be curious about how it got there, where it came from. Learn a little bit more about that. Get a little more involved in that because that matters too. Yeah, you just you just said a word that, that just, I love, curiosity, mm-hmm. right? I mean, uh, not everybody's curious, but I'd like to think that, you know, because of people like Bourdain, that people have become a little bit more curious and mm-hmm. a little bit more adventurous and, you know, willing to step outside those, those you know, traditional boundaries and, and just give it a try. Mm-hmm. You know, what do you got to lose? Yep. Exactly. Yep. All right. So speaking of the people who are bringing us the food, Gilbert, I will throw this to you first, but Tony, you've also worked in restaurants. So one of the things that Bourdain did is not only did he introduce Introduce us to you know to new foods and places, but in the very beginning with Kitchen Confidential, he threw open the doors to the kitchen, and the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there was a whole lot of ugly. Oh, wow. He was not afraid to talk about it and not afraid to share it. Um, I think uh, it, I can remember kind of when that came out that people who were in the industry or who wanted to be in the industry kind of went one of two ways. Like they looked at what was really happening in the kitchens and their eyes got real big and they're like, oh, hell no, I'm out of here. Or else they went, well, that looks really awesome. Give me more of that. But um, yeah, Gilbert, if you want to kind of talk a little bit about that, about, you know, what he did and exposing kind of the underbelly of the of a restaurant's uh, kitchen. And, and I mean, it's a, it's a dark world. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, point blank, it's, it's, you know, it's not as glamorous as what people take it. I know um, different networks, Food Network, Cooking Channel, always think it's like, you know, bam, and white coats and this and that, but it's 14, 15 hour days, you know, drugs, alcohol, you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're closing, you're leaving the kitchen at one in the morning to be back at nine or 10 in the morning to get ready for the next day. Like it's, it's an abusive, you know, there's, there's knives, there's fire, there's hot things going around, there's stuff being thrown around, you know, you're going to get cut, you're going to get burned, you're going to get splashed with grease, you're going to, like, it's, it's, uh... Um, Is that why chefs have tattoos so often to cover up all the scars? <laughs> probably. I would imagine a lot of chefs have sleeves because, I mean, you know, I got burns mm-hmm. right there, mm-hmm. so it's just, it's it's part of the world like if you haven't been burned you haven't been cut in the kitchen like you're not you're yeah. not doing it right yeah. and 
it's um it's a hard life i mean i've been doing it 25 years now and it's you know i haven't you know i mean you can go two ways you know there's there's you can go that down that dark path but you can kind of go on the gray path a little bit you know so it's it's hard but i mean that's just that's just part of the kitchen life i mean that's just what it is and you know like i was saying earlier like i wish people his kitchen confidential did bring that out but i think people still don't want to believe that that's what actually happens like maybe he's just kind of embellishing and kind of making you know oh it doesn't but it's i mean it's like that 100 percent. and i wish you know for me for my experience in the kitchen and with customers that i wish people would kind of almost take that you know into consideration mm-hmm. um you know we do we do a lot of work just so y'all can you know sit down and have a plate of food and and it's a it's a pain in the ass sometimes when you sit down for a week or a month and you're putting these menus together and you're putting all your thought and time and effort into be like man that's going to taste good with this that's going to taste good with that and then we have you know someone come in and be like well can i get the noodles from that plate <laughs> with the sauce from this plate and oh, then the i'm guilty of that sometimes. and i'm just like <laughs> you know and of course we're in that we kind of want to give the customer what they want but at the same time like we want the customer to kind of respect the process mm-hmm. that kind of went into it and of course if it's a simple veggie substitution or something like that like you know we're going to accommodate the best mm-hmm. we can but um, I'm one of those chefs that... But y'all are back there cussing us out. Yeah, you just can't, you just can't hear us. Like, <laughs> man, table 33, that, you know, like... How many modifiers can we have? I know, on and we, on one order, somebody's going to get a ticket like this small <laughs> with just like all these modifiers, and it's... But, yes, the kitchen life is hard. Please respect us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, correct me if I'm wrong, but, I mean, there are high, high rates of substance abuse and suicide in this industry, right? I yeah. mean, yeah, I mean, it's... You know, we see it. We see it a lot. I mean, we've had those kind of things happen here in Little Rock. Mm-hmm. You know, Arkansas. I mean, all over the country. You know, a huge factor is possibly the life. Obviously, the abuse of, of drugs and stuff. You know, alcohol. You know, that definitely all plays a huge a huge part. And sometimes you get down those dark roads, and you're, you know, at a certain point. I guess you know some people just, you know give up or whatever takes them to that point where they need to you know take their own life i've been very fortunate to kind of not go all the way but you know i mean there's been there's been times where i'm just like you know i'm just gonna drink this whole bottle of mm-hmm. vodka and be like this you know i'm, I'm glad that i've never contemplated suicide yeah. or or abuse of other drugs or whatever but it's it's definitely something you know as a whole as cooks and it's just the restaurant industry itself like it's it's a hard life and you know it just i wish there was some way where when you can have someone you know help you know have that helping hand where you'd be like look don't don't do that let's let's go talk like let's not even worry about drinking or or smoking weed or whatever Mm -hmm. like let's just talk and like Mm -hmm. see what's going on and see we can fix things and i think because of the long hours and you know after you get out of here you don't you don't want to talk the first thing you want to do is like oh i'm gonna go drink or yeah. i'm gonna go smoke or i'm gonna go do this yeah and it has to be first and foremost for the person to be willing to accept the help or actually seek help because mm-hmm. it, it is a i mean it's one of those things i mean i don't know what the stats are on you know people taking their lives in the restaurant industry but i would imagine it's pretty yeah. high my experience in the hospitality industry and that kind of stuff is it's sensory overload the entire time you're there. It's the sound, it's the people, it's the smells, it's all that kind of stuff. And so if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, when you get off, like you've got to be able to shut down. And sometimes people in the industry turn to sure. not healthy things to numb yeah. you and help you shut it down. Yeah. So we kind of move from food to travel here for a little bit. Although with Bourdain, everything is intertwined. You can't, yeah. it's, it's hard to kind of extract that, but, um, Here's one of his quotes on travel. It's one that I've I've read this many times and I absolutely love it because it's the truth and it's been my experience with travel. Travel isn't always pretty. It isn't always comfortable. Sometimes it hurts. It even breaks your heart, but that's okay. The journey changes you. It should change you. 
It leaves marks on your memory, on your consciousness, on your heart, and on your body. You take something with you. Hopefully, you leave something good behind. Um, I don't remember whenever when I first heard that or read it, but it has definitely, um, for me, affected the way I travel and the things that I want to go and do when I travel. Um, you know, he was big on, on being with the locals. And I'll say, I was actually having this conversation with a friend of mine um, last night about, you know, going to places and do you do the touristy stuff or do you not? And I was like, I, I made the argument for you need to do some of the touristy stuff. If you're in Rome and you don't see the Sistine Chapel, you know, you really have missed out on something. One of the things, the gifts that he gave us is showing us that there's so much more to travel than the sanitized version in the American whitewash version of, of some destinations, you know, the disney vibe version of everything, as much as I love Disney, you know, and that there are other things to see when you just step outside the boundary just a little bit. So, um, Tony, I'll start with you here. If you want to kind of just in general talk about how he affected the travel industry and, and what he gave us there. Yeah, well, I think he definitely had a positive impact. Uh, you know, I, I learned, you know, of course, the, the market that I catered to in my career in travel is the American market. And uh, like I said before, it's, it's, it's a little bit disappointing that, that so few Americans have passports and travel abroad, uh, but that's changing. Um, but uh, Americans, this is what I was gonna say, is that uh, Americans tend to be uh, pretty risk averse when they're traveling. And tr travel marketing traditionally has been, you know, very, you know. Glossy. Glossy, <laughs> yeah, sugar candy coated, you know, mm -hmm. uh, call, call it what you will. Uh, rainbows and unicorns and to be able to have these high expectations and then if they get to a destination and, and you know their things don't go right they oftentimes are unprepared for that <clears throat> and you know i was brought up to to look at things like you know i might i was saying earlier before this that my dad used to say you know you, there are two ways you can travel you can travel as a voyeur in that bubble or you can travel as a participant and, mm -hmm. and do the participatory thing and I think there's a time and a place for traveling in a bubble. If you want to take your family to an all-inclusive resort and unwind and read books and swim and play with the dolphins, that's fabulous, great, go do that. Uh, but if you want to really broaden your horizons and really grow as a, as a human being, I think it's important to, you know, to step out, go, you know, just get in it, get dirty. And that's what Anthony Bourdain showed people, mm -hmm. is that you can go out there and get your hands dirty and come out a better person for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, in the travel industry or just friends around the world from, from various you know places, uh, and I, I talk about this on my podcast, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, um, a, a lot of us joke about how, you know, sometimes the very best travel experiences happen when things go horribly wrong. Yeah. And I think everybody, has some sort of story like that, you know. Um, I think of a friend who was in Europe when uh, on business, and they were flying back to the states. And you may remember this about 10, 10 or twelve years. I'm not sure many years ago. Time seems so amorphous these days. But um, they were flying back, scheduled to fly back from France, and the, there was a volcanic eruption in, oh, yeah. in, in Iceland, Iceland that yeah. just mm -hmm. shut down air traffic from mm -hmm. Europe to the U.S. for like I don't know, at least a week or two, mm -hmm. maybe. And and these people, my friend who is in the travel industry, she was uh, my sister had actually planned a, a side trip for her. She ended up getting stuck in this little hotel in rural France, mm -hmm. and at first she was really frustrated because she was, you know, she was anxious to get home, she mm -hmm. wanted to get back to work, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly it went off and she said, wait, this is a blessing. Yeah. Stuck in front. I'm taking yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a lot worse places to be stuck. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, it, and she ended up having one of the very best, you know, trips of her lifetime mm -hmm. just because by, by accident. So I think that that's one of the things that Anthony Bourdain shows people is like, just keep your, keep your mind open, keep, you know, just things are not ever going to go exactly as planned. It's mm -hmm. just not possible. There's always going to be some hiccup along the way, mm -hmm. and um, and that's that's the time to really just go, hey, right, let's just take the ride yep. and see what happens. Yeah. I think some of my best trips ever were. It's funny the trips where I can remember that I was literally in tears, crying in frustration uh, or sadness or anger over something ended up being some of my best trips ever, just because. Like, there's a time where you just throw up your hands and you're like, I give up. Yeah. Just, you know, travel gods take over and just show me what to do and where to go and what to see. And, uh, you know, I give up trying to control this. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think that he was real good about, like, not trying to control the, the just experience. Just going with the flow. Yeah. You know, it's, you just made me think, talking about behind the scenes, I, and I've, I've contemplated this frequently, like, you know, 
on that program, on his programs, various programs, you know, you don't think about all of the production that goes into that. Mm. You know, they had a real lean production team. They had an advanced team. They had, you know, they prepared as much as they could, but they didn't have huge budgets. Right. So they made do. And I think that would actually be a really interesting story to tell is like, you know, how did they pull off these magical episodes and make it look so seamless because you know there were, there oh, were no, a lot of bumps sure. in the road yeah. along the way that yeah. we don't know about you know yep. i think that would be real, real interesting to, to learn about yeah the the bloopers the bloopers yeah, right? <laughs> you know they got on one of the shows i think they actually left it in where one of the camera guys hit i forgot what asian country they were in but they had all their proteins or all their plates already stacked up for the day and i think it was a mic boom or camera guy or they hit it and knocked oh, everything down no. and like the restaurant owners were just like <laughs> obviously they paid for the you know they paid for the the meals they broke but like, you could hear like all the plates come crashing down and, and that was supposed to be for the whole day well, and one of the things i loved about the way he would talk about travel personally with himself is so I used to be afraid to do things when I traveled for fear of looking like a fool or sticking out like a sore thumb or, you know, maybe accidentally insulting somebody because I didn't know the culture and all of that kind of stuff. And he just flat out would say, I do that and I don't care. And he was willing to laugh at himself and laugh at those situations. I, I mean, I can remember him saying, I am so out of place in Japan. For one thing, I think he's, he's probably so two feet taller than everybody else. And he's like, I do everything wrong. Uh, uh, you know, they have such precision and such ritual mm -hmm. behind the way they eat food and serve food. And he's like, and I do every last bit of it wrong and I screw it up every single time and I still love going there. And so it's almost like he gave us permission for travel to be ugly and screwed up and for you to make yeah. a mistake and to eat the wrong thing and to, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And to approach it with a sense of humility and, and self-deprecation and, and mm -hmm. humor. You know, I think that's the other facet to, to Bourdain. I mean, the guy's funny. Oh, he's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, really funny. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other gift, and of course we mentioned it a few times, that he, he really gave to us was his writing and his, his writing skills and the way he could tell a story, um, you know, either around the food that he was producing or the place that he went and that kind of stuff. And, and I love this quote from him. If you're a writer, Particularly if you're a writer or a storyteller of any kind, there is something already kind of monstrously wrong with you. So, which is, you know, perfect for the book festival. Mm -hmm. the book festival. I was saying we need to get that made on some uh, bookmarks for the library or something like that. But um, yeah, I mean, he was so very gifted at sharing his stories and other people's stories at getting those stories out there to the world and, you know, getting them published and telling them in, in a bunch of different ways. But um, I just kind of want to talk a little bit about how important storytelling is in this industry. Um, the stories we tell behind, you know, the, the things that we do and that kind of stuff. And, and Gilbert, you know, we were kind of talking earlier that there has been a trend recently that you can't just sell a product. You have to also, you have to sell the story behind it. And for good or for bad, how do you think that's kind of affected your industry and what you do? For the good, I think it's brought a more awareness to where food comes from. You know, um, you know the local scene. You know, we all want to help out our local economy. You know, I, you know. So the story of where stuff comes from, I think is is great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think mentioning those people that you know busted their butt making a certain you know whether it's produce whether it's protein whether it's this like being able to showcase them on the menu um i think it's great but i think sometimes people customers i guess get a little they gets a little carried away sometimes um there's an episode of portlandia i don't know if you all oh, yeah. seen mm -hmm. this but they go into a restaurant and they ask where the chicken's from and then they start getting into this thing we're like well what's the chicken's name what farm did yeah, it come yeah. from like how do they kill it how do they do this and i I think people sometimes get a little too carried away with it. And us chefs, we want to tell you a story. We want to tell you where stuff comes from. Like we want to, you know, we want to tell you how we prepared it and, and all that. But I think sometimes people want this huge, you know, book of, or, you know, long paragraph of, and I think it's, I just like the more 
simple story. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the farm it comes from. This is how it's prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, the bad is that I think, I think because of certain food shows and people's perception on food, and I think it's kind of gotten a little carried away. Like, I've seen menus from other restaurants and like, you know, people actually write, I've seen, um, menus where it's actually a story it's actually yeah, a poem written out. <laughs> it's written out i mean the actual plate is in there somewhere mm -hmm. but it's a poem of, i'm just like man that is just i think that's just too much <laughs> like i don't i guess you know obviously i don't write that well that's why I could, so, <laughs> um, so in the good sense that's i think that's a good part is you know showcasing the people that have also put in their hard work with their product you know to be in your restaurant or be in anybody else's restaurant and being able to showcase that. So, so maybe the customer would be like, oh, well, let's go visit that farm. Or when we go to, you know, one of the marketplaces, we can buy, you know, their protein or their produce. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some restaurants in a bad way get a little bit too carried away with it. You know, it, it, it has its good and it's bad, but I guess at least as a cook, you know, I know as a server, it might be a little bit different how they actually explain the food. But you know, yeah. when, when I come to a table and I talk to a person, like I, I try to elaborate a little bit on how different stuff, but I try to keep it as simple as possible. So the actual food doesn't lose its, you know, yeah. luster, I guess, or That's its it. importance. So. Yeah. so, you know, I think what you were just describing, it, it just, just reminds me, the word that keeps coming to mind is artist. You're an artist. Mm -hmm. And you present your art to people, and if they want to, you know, deconstruct it, that's kind of, eh, that doesn't feel so great, right? Mm -hmm. But, and I think of, you know, people, people who are writers or, or painters or sculptors, you know, what they create is their creation, and that's what it is, you know, so take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. You might like it, you might not like it. Everybody has different tastes, so I think there's, there's, there's that. Well, and then even more to that, like, because well, like, well, I saw on the cooking channel, like they do it like this, like, why don't you do it like that? I was like, whoa, buddy, I don't go, I don't go into your office and tell you, you know what? Yeah. I think you need to put a door here. Right? <laughs> or like, this window oh, needs yeah. to be this much. Or you know what? I think you should extract that tooth this way. Like, yeah. you know, I think, you know, I'm not gonna watch a doctor like ER or something and be like, oh, I'm gonna go operate on someone. Like, yeah. I know you're the professional, you do it. Mm -hmm. exactly. So I think that's kind of the same mindset that I know I, for sure I have. And I think other people, you know, other chefs and cooks that I know, like, we don't go tell you to do your, your job. Yeah. So mm -hmm. have some respect and don't tell us how to do yeah. our job. Like I said, we'll accommodate the best we can, but like, you know, be yeah. gentle. That reminds me, and I know, I know you've heard this before, but when, when I owned Atlas, so one of my pet peeves was when people would come in and tell me, hey, you know what you should do? I'm like, oh, really? So you're <laughs> telling me how to run my business now. You know, mm -hmm. This is my baby, and you want me to mess with it. Yeah. Okay, cool, mm -hmm. based on what you think. Um, but anyway, um, you know, that, that, so anyway, I, was, I think we were ta talking a little bit earlier during the break uh, about you know s stories of, of, of eating, and I've got one in mind that this was a, a crazy adventure that I went on in the Middle East with, with a buddy of mine, uh, one of my best friends, and we were in Luxor in, in Egypt, and he came down with the stomach bug, mm -hmm. poisoning something. He was laid out for a couple of days. And this is one of these stories where, you know, things went wrong, we were off. I mean, we didn't really have a schedule when we were on a shoestring, we're backpacking, right? We're going from, you know, Egypt through Jordan and Syria and Turkey and then onward. Um, so this is the beginning of the trip. So we're in Luxor, he's, he's in bed, laid up, and I had nothing but time to kill. And, you know, we'd been doing the touristy things and you know, mm -hmm. so forth uh, and so on. And uh, so I was sitting on, at, at a, a little patio cafe on the, on the banks of the Nile, having a beer in the afternoon. Um, and suddenly uh, this guy strikes up a conversation with me <clears throat> and he was this absolutely beautiful Nubian man, if you know what, if you know what I mean. And his name is Muhammad. <laughs> and, uh, and he spoke perfect English, and he had been in the military, and uh, and he was, uh, you know, he was educated and, and cool, and we just kind of hit it off, and we started just figuring out that we had a lot of things in common, and kind of befriended each other. Well, that chance encounter led to a whole odyssey, where over the next couple of days we started hanging out with him, and with his friends and his family, and they invited us to uh, to a wedding in Luxor. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I mean, I was like, what is this 
cool? I mean, like, <laughs> is your, everyone going to be okay with these gringos, you know, coming up? And uh, they were like, no, no, you're with us, you're good, you're family, you know, come on. And so we went to, and we, we really didn't know what we were getting into, but the night of the big event, we went to uh, to a little house in the heart of, of the old city in Luxor, and it, and it's it's just you know everything about it is ancient feeling mm -hmm. and, and magical, and we went. They invited us into the back room of the house, and it was only men, and they you know broke out some some whiskey. Well, of course you know this is this is a it's kind of not cool right? yeah. drinking alcohol yeah. in, in this, in, in this sort of, you know, setting, but they were, there was like, we just don't talk about this outside of this room. So okay. we ended up drinking whiskey. And here and you are talking about it outside of the room. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been a long time, so. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but I mean, I think they meant don't talk to the other guests yeah. when we get to yeah. the yeah. wedding. So mm -hmm. this is pre-wedding prep, right? So we're, we're getting our drink on pre -gaming, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pre -gaming <laughs> and, and smoking cigarettes and then they were like, okay, well, it's almost time for us to go to the wedding. And we walked back out of the room and all of a sudden there's this massive spread of food uh, for us to eat before we go to the mm -hmm. wedding. And the, uh, the the head of the household, his wife and, and her sisters had cooked this this feast and it was it was pigeon. Stuffed mm -hmm. pigeon was the, the featured dish you know, with rice and all these savory, wonderful flavors. And and I'd never had pigeon before. And I thought, well, you know, hey, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'm yeah, doing this. Yeah, let's do know? it. <laughs> And uh, so we had this amazing feast, you know, again, eating with your, with our hands and, and so on. And, and uh, then the next thing you know, they're like, all right, guys, time to go. Let's pile in the car and we're going to go down to the, to the big, to the ceremony, to, to the party. And uh, we get to the, to this intersection that's covered with, uh, uh, you know, like tarps and, and whatnot. And there's a big stage set up in the center of the intersection, and rows and rows of seats and uh, just hundreds and hundreds of, of men again. I mean, there were no women involved and, you know, again, I can't judge it's just their culture mm -hmm. and uh it was, you know so we're like okay cool and we we sit down we hang out and there were they got into this crazy crazy trance-like party where there were musicians with you know playing all kinds of drums that i'd never seen before and you know instruments stringed instruments and horns and whatnot this is all before a wedding yeah. yeah yeah and and it was all the old men all the elders all the way down to the little boys <clears throat> and the little boys are running around mm -hmm. pointing at us and making fun of us and you know trying to, to harass us <laughs> well then the next thing you know they're starting to pass around these little glasses little tea glasses that have a little little bit of burning hash in them with a little aluminum foil and just passing around smoking smoking hash <laughs> so everyone's stoned out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was like and we just got into this crazy trance and it was just it was one of those things that if my buddy hadn't gotten his stomach bugs, yes. that yeah. never would have never happened. Never would have happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, so. And oh, the stories you can tell from that now. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. Um, but we were talking about eating weird food. Well, I mean, pigeon is a little weird for here, but I, I guess. I don't know. That's how pigeon got here, though. It got brought over as a. As food. Really? Yeah. As food, yeah. yeah. Really? Uh, and it's that. pretty good. I mean, if you haven't tried it, it's like quail. Don't yeah. Not yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess it's kind of like a cross between quail and chicken, maybe, something like that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there was another, this is another cultural experience. I was living for a brief time in Palau, which is a, an island uh, nation in the, in the West Pacific. And basically I followed a girl there and we went yeah. scuba diving for a long time. Her dad, her dad was <laughs> and we did other things that I won't talk about. But, uh, but anyway, we went to this, uh, to this, cer this ceremony. Um, it, was a, it was a gathering and they were celebrating sea turtles. And in the Palauan culture, you know, the sea turtles are sacred and, you know, of course they're an endangered species. So, but there was this one day a year where they would, you know, celebrate the sea turtle and of course sacrifice the sea turtle and everybody eats the sea turtle. It's ironic. But anyway, again, I was like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this, but, you know, I was a guest of these people. And, you know, so yeah, I, I ate an endangered species. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say, but it was actually really yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a reason. Yeah, but not judging the culture. They, right, they again, you know, and, and it was permitted. It was legal. It wasn't something, you mm -hmm. know, that was, that was forbidden. Well, I mean, so with the storytelling aspect, and, and you've got all these great stories, you mentioned your podcast. Yeah. And I, I would kind of like you to talk about that for a minute, about sure. why why you're doing it, kind of what it entails. Um but also why it is so important to kind of sit around and tell these stories about where we've traveled and where we've eaten and where we've stayed and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, I had intended to do this as a, as a kind of a marketing ploy for, for Alice when we were open and I was just too busy running the business. I just didn't have mm -hmm. the bandwidth literally to do it. Um, and then when the pandemic hit and during lockdown, 
I started reconnecting with old friends around the world. We're doing Zoom calls, we're just mm -hmm. kind of catching up and comparing notes. What's it like here? What's it like? How, how is it in your country? And I thought, man, now more than ever is the time to tell these stories. And, you know, I'm really lucky that I've been able to travel as much as I, I have, thanks to my parents and, you know, just a lot of luck and, and a lot of um, uh, blessing. But, uh, uh, yeah, so reconnecting with all these friends, we're talking on a regular basis. I'm talking to a friend one day in Finland, the next day I'm talking to someone in Thailand or South Africa or what have you. And uh, I, it occurred to me, I was like, man, we're talking and we're sharing all these memories and stories with each other. Like, remember that time when we were in Buenos Aires and, you know, XYZ happened and, oh my God, can you believe we're not dead? Things like that. And um, I thought, man, you know, why aren't we recording this? It's, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a writer. I like to write, and but it, it requires a lot of discipline. Talking is a lot easier, <laughs> and so I like the easy way, push the easy button. Yeah. So, uh, so that's that's how I kind of it developed into to. I was going to do a blog, and then I thought, no, I want to have to do the live conversation, conversation yeah. with mm -hmm. people, invite people into the room with us, and and so the idea is like a lot of my friends in the travel industry around the world, um, you know, they may be hoteliers, they may be um, uh, adventure guides, they may be, you know, safari outfitters, uh, what have you. Everybody has a background and they have a story. And, and you know, one of the things that frustrates me in, in tr travel journalism, and it, it's actually not really journalism, I think there's not a lot of integrity in many publications, but having said that, you know, there are real stories to be told. So rather than talking about thread counts and spa treatments at the Montage in Laguna Beach, mm -hmm. you know, let's talk about, hey, I've got David Sugden on the line, he's a safari outfitter from Nairobi, half British, half Kenyan, <clears throat> He's he knows everybody, he's big into horse racing, mm -hmm. you know, David, tell me, you know, tell us about the neighborhood you grew up in, mm -hmm. or tell us one of those stories about when something went horribly wrong and you got, had a wild experience. We've all got those stories, yeah, yeah. and, you know, podcasting is a perfect way to, to, to document it and then distribute it, and mm -hmm. if you build an audience, great. If not, so for me, it's more about, you know, just, you know, telling the stories, you know, getting it recorded for posterity or whatever it is. It's not an ego trip. It's yeah. just like, hey, this is really cool. Let's let's rap. Let's talk about it. Yeah. And so it's called Get Out of Town. Talk and Travel with yeah. So Perfect. get out of town dot travel. And um, yeah, so I'm just recording conversations with people and uh, yeah, just telling when when in Manila. You know, mm -hmm. like I think before we started recording I was saying people say, well what, what should I do? When I go get to Manila, well, okay, get your rest, get out the hotel, walk past the concierge, get on a bus, mm -hmm. go to a cafe, sit down and have a conversation, and that's traveling. Yeah. And yeah. and I think that uh, you know, hey, there's a time and a place for Disney. There's a time and a place for cruises and all of that business. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, it's it's getting back into mm -hmm. that participatory yeah. thing, and uh, and it's the backstory. You know, and and I think like a lot, like for these hoteliers, and you know this better than anybody. There are stories behind the scenes oh, at hotels. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> we got some stories. stories. <laughs> yeah, and and, and in, in the business, we, we joke amongst ourselves about you know whether it's celebrities or politicians and mm -hmm. the shenanigans they get into. Yeah, lots and, of celebrities. And stories, there's yeah. there are a lot of secrets out there that just don't get out there. We're not going to be talking about that stuff. But but there are there is the backstory of you know what how did what's how did you get into being a hotelier? How did mm -hmm. you know, what, what inspired you to 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 build or restore this magnificent property and, mm -hmm. and present it to the world as, as, as a work of art. Uh, you know, that's, that's interesting stuff. Yeah. It's not just putting your head in a pillow. That's I mean, it's absolutely true. Um, and you know, for me, I know travel has had a, just a huge impact on my life. I mean, that's how I have my family because yeah. one day I packed my bags and moved to another country with nowhere to live and no job. Yeah. And I met my husband there. He's my souvenir, you know. <laughs> so, Heck of a souvenir. You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that, you know, I always tease people and say, yeah, he's my souvenir. <laughs> um, but, you know, so that's how important it was to me. And I'm never going to get my kids interested in travel by handing them a glossy travel magazine and saying, read these articles. How I get them interested in travel is we sit around at the dinner table and I'm like, oh, let me tell you about that time when I was on a boat in the Greek islands. And did you know that when a family moves from island to island in Greece, the only way they can do it is by putting everything they own in a boat. So you are on the boat with their furniture, their bird cages with their birds in it, their donkeys, uh, you know, everything they own. And, you know, just kind of talking about that and how, what a funny experience that was. And, you know, we, we still love to laugh and reminisce and tell the story about when my husband saw my, my, not my husband, my son saw Michelangelo's David for the first time. And I won't say what he said on video, just cause 
he might be, he, he probably wouldn't be embarrassed. He's, he's immune yeah. by now, but yeah, it's, it's probably not appropriate. But, you know, just kind of sharing those stories. And I mean, I know you're a dad, you have an adorable little daughter. I mean, you probably want to tell her the stories behind what you do and food and eating and that kind of stuff. Like, you know, how do you kind of approach that? So as, as a baby, you know, we, my wife and I at the time, you know, we actually went to Star of India mm-hmm. and took her with us. And she tore down some tandoori, like tiki mm-hmm. masala, yeah. like all that stuff. And like, of course, when we tell that story, they're like, oh, you're a chef. That's why I was like, but she doesn't know that. Yeah, yeah. She's one. Yeah. Like, she doesn't know that I'm a chef. She could, she don't have any clue whatsoever that I cook for a living. And, but, People just kind of had that perception like, oh, well, she eats well because, you know, you're her dad. Mm -hmm. Now it's that she's a little older. It's a little bit different, but she's willing to taste a lot of different things that most adults would eat. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another experience. (laughs) You know, I'm like, come on, you're like 47 and you don't, you don't eat this. I'm like, really? Like, Mm -hmm. at what point do you just, but you know, you have those people that just eat a certain way and that's it. But, um, because I'm so big into food, I try to let her experience different cultures through food as well. Yeah. So when I get her on the weekend, you know, I try to make something different that she's never had before. Or we try to go to a restaurant or get takeout from somewhere that she's never had. And sometimes it's like, no, I want this. And I'm like, well, too bad. This is what you're gonna eat. We're gonna have gyros today and you're gonna, you're gonna eat a gyro. I mean, yeah. if you like it, you like it, you don't, you don't. Um, but you know, she's six now, so I don't know if I would take her to like overseas. Well, obviously we couldn't do that right now anyway, but Mm -hmm. I want to wait till she gets a little bit older. So I think she can actually appreciate the experience of seeing another culture or seeing Mm -hmm. another country. So I am very excited, uh, you know, when she gets older that we'll be able to take her, take her, Mm -hmm. you know, go to Europe, go to Asia, mm-hmm. go in, you know, go wherever. And like, she'll be able, because of the food that I've actually shown her or yeah. given to her, made her eat in a sense that when she gets to this country, she'd be like, oh yeah, we've had that before. Yeah. Or we have that. So, that. Yeah. so that's kind of how I'm showing her right now, what different cultures. And I guess, you know, because obviously it's, she's too young to travel. Cause I want her to really, Appreciate. Not too young. You never too young. Well, I know. But, you know <laughs> I mean, but at the time that we're in now, you yeah, know, it's hard. I mean, it's we can hard. only go different thing, so yeah. far right now. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if COVID wasn't around, it'd be a different story. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been to London and it was amazing. Yeah. We, we were there for almost two weeks and we got lost. Like like you said, yes. get lost. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, we get on the tube. It's very easy to get lost in London. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's it's so easy. Easy. <laughs> you know, we would get lost and we had. You know, I had a proper English breakfast at some mm-hmm. pub that I don't even know the name of, but it was amazing. Like, you know, we, we did the, you know, we tried the fish and chips and we went to the Tower of London and to, you know, Winston's Abbey and all that. But we, we got off the beaten path and we actually went to this Mediterranean restaurant twice because the first time it was around our Airbnb that we were at, but it was so good. We, you know, the next, I think after two nights, we went back again and we actually, I went in there and they're like, hey, you're back. I was like, I want what y'all eat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. That's want, the best way to order. I was like, I want you to prepare. That's what my He's husband like, does. Like, 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 it doesn't matter. Like I was it, like, yeah. I need three plates of whatever y'all eat. Yeah. Whatever, when you close down and you pack a box to take home, that's what I want. And they actually, they hooked us up yeah. and it was amazing. Like, it was way better than what we ordered. So yeah. um, definitely get lost, talk to people. We did that once at, uh, one of Morimoto's restaurants, and he actually was there that evening. So the waiter said, here's what you do. Tell us what you want to spend per person, and he'll pick it for you and send it out there. And we're like, yeah. deal, <laughs> deal. Just, this is this is our this is our kind of, you know, top thing. This yeah. is what we want to spend per person, and like just fed us so much food that night. It was just absolutely amazing. But, I, you know, speaking of traveling with kids, though, I tell people who, if they, if they have kids and they want to do an international trip, but they don't know where to start, I'm always, because we love Italy and go there all the time, I'm like, do Italy, because pizza, meatballs and lasagna pasta, yep, yeah. and pasta i was like it is easy. it's very safe and easy for kids to eat there my, my kids you know first went to italy when they were little bitty and like they're like this is heaven there's pizza on every menu everywhere you go so that's a good easy place to take kids but are you gonna 
Yeah, well, them. what you were saying is, you know, I want to eat what you eat. And, mm -hmm. and that, that reminds me of, um, you know, when I made the example of, you know, when you're, you know, go bypass the concierge and whatever, go talk to people. Um, it, you know, well, here's an actual example of, of, of living by that mantra. I was in uh, Sao Paulo for a, for a business conference, and uh, it's, there's a much longer story to this that's going to be on my podcast. So yeah. <laughs> but this part of the story is, is, is applicable. So I'm at the, it's a luxury travel trade show, and I'm being wined and dined. They're taking me to all the Michelin star restaurants. I ate ants. I ate you know weird grasses, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and it was beautiful. It was wonderful. Nice to be hosted. Um, and so I had been introduced to a, a, a now friend. It was a colleague of another friend of mine that I went to college with. Again, a long story. But uh, the last night of the show, I was free. And I said, hey, we wanted to go out to dinner. And he said, OK, um, I'll, let's go to, uh, what would you think about going to blah, 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 Michelin star restaurant, this one. And I was like, man, I've, I've already been there. I've already been there. They already took me there. Mm -hmm. And he's like, ah, he's striking out. 